bringing LARP to a refugee camp without really knowing how. Who is this? This is a sheep on the lookout for a dangerous wolf that is tormenting the nearby villages, stealing and eating their sheep and chickens. Or, with a little less immersion, it is a kid in a refugee camp in Lebanon who is playing a LARP made by locals. Fantasie for Brunner is a Norwegian NGO that have been working with LARP as a tool to strengthen civil society in Belarus and in Palestine for some years. And today I will tell the story about the first time we did something in Lebanon, an attempt to empower young people to create activities for children in a country we didn't know. In 2012, some LARPers in Bergen, Norway, spoke to a member of the NGO Al Jalil, who makes activities for youth and children in Rashidi refugee camp in Lebanon. And she asked, why do the whole world care so much about the West Bank and nobody cares about the refugees in Lebanon? So a few weeks later, I got a call from Bergen and uh, uh, Martin, uh, we just uh, made a promise to make kids LARP in, uh, in Lebanon. Do you want to help us? Oh, kids LARP in Lebanon, you say? And I have hardly ever been to a kids LARP, and I've been once to Lebanon on vacation in Beirut. So I said, yeah, sure, I will help you with that. <laughs> and then we gathered in Bergen for training, and uh, we had a Palestinian who had lived in Rashidi camp coming to, to help us about the daily life. So we asked him, what do the kids do in their free time? Uh, they hang around and sometimes they play. Ah, play, that sounds good. What do they play? War. Okay, uh, maybe some other things? No, only war. Okay, uh, and they throw stones at each other. Yeah, great. So, um, and you will often hear young people say they hope there will be a real war soon because then at least something is happening. Okay, so we looked at each other and decided maybe we should go for something else than the buffer swords this time. <laughs> so we listened to more people with expertise on refugee camps and human rights, culture, LARP, everything else, and we convinced uh, Fatima and Riyadh from Palestine to join us. And the 1st of May 2013, we arrived in Beirut, waiting for Najat from Al Jalil to pick us up and take us to Rashidi camp. So Najat arrived uh, with a minibus. And uh, guys, we don't have the permits to enter the camp yet. Okay, and Riyadh's visa has not been granted. So, so far, so bad. And we into the minibus and through the streets lined with flags for the Iranian export fair or something. And we come to a military facility outside Beirut. And here we first talk to a soldier and then to another soldier with a little bit bigger gun and then to a soldier with a very big hat and even bigger gun. And finally we reach the boss the guy with jeans and t-shirts saying a poker player. And he had a really big desk and a TV and a fan. And we got two really, really small plastic chairs to sit in front of him. But uh, half an hour later, then uh, after a lot of uh, people running in and out with guns and shouting in Arabic, we magically were handed the permits and we were good to go. So the bad news was that Riyadh was denied his visa. He was an engineer and they are unfortunately more known for yeah, helping out Hezbollah with kind of ballistic expertise and that kind of things, then drama workshops, so no entry for the engineers. We drove southwards into Lebanon and more and more Hezbollah flags were lining the roads and uh, Ayatollah Khomeini were looking angrily at us from some of the rooftops, paintings of course. Uh, and then uh, after, after a while we came to Tyre and we got our papers examined uh, by the by the Lebanese army. And we were given access to Rashidi camp. Looks like this. It's two square kilometers, and there are uh, 25,000 Palestinian refugees living here. Most of them uh, displaced after the 1948 Arab-Israeli war, and some refugees from the ongoing Syrian civil war. After 50 years of residency here, the, town or the camp is still like a mix of a, of a town and a prison. Our aim was to train volunteers at Al Jalil to become children LARP organizers. And our first uh, step was some drama exercises to get to know each other. Oh yeah, drama exercises. Changing uh, places without stepping on the line. 
nice and tidy on the line, but not too physical. Uh, not only because I got trapped here, but mostly because all the girls opted out. And when one girl opted out, then all the others also opted out. The norms in the camp is very conservative, and the rumors spread very easily. And Al Jalil, they do a terrific job at talking to the families and making sure nothing indecent will go on. And that makes it possible for girls to take part along with the boys. But we, we had to adjust quite quickly. But even though we adjusted the level of physical closeness, we, quite, uh, we experienced that some of the participants were quite skeptical to, to what we did. What was interesting was when we came to the second step, started uh, playing some LARPs. We played uh, The Family Anderson by Åke Nolemo and Jan Reklander, and When Our Destinies Meet by Morgan Jarl and Petra Carlson. And it was amazing how LARP made a stronger alibi than drama exercises for physical contact. Then it was the third step, preparing the LARP. And we had written a LARP about a monster who was waking up from a hundred years of sleep. And we made sure it was low budget, so we created a monster from only the trash we found laying around. <laughs> the children... Um, had to send this monster back to sleep, and there was only one day way to do it with water balloons. But they were all locked down in a wizard chest, and the children had to help various characters they met along the way to solve a riddle on how to open the chest. And a great success, they defeated the monster. <laughs> uh, some of the participants, they didn't think the balloons were sufficient to repel this monster. So they <laughs> <got> went, <laughs> went on with <laughs> But uh, we, we secured him after a while. <laughs> so that was the training. Now it was time for the locals to do their part. We had lost several of the volunteers underway, but we still had the six or seven left. On the other hand, these people were really committed to uh, and looking forward to make a children LARP. We decided to make a LARP uh, about a wolf, and the budget was 10 euro. So um, we coached the volunteers for three days, and we made uh, props and groups and characters. And then it was the big day. And we were waiting for the, uh, to for the participants to show up at one o'clock. And at one o'clock, we had one participant. <laughs> ah, shit, what are we doing now? Are nobody interested in this? It w and the volunteers were really disappointed. And we had to we call to the football team and the basket team and the dancing team and then uh, look who's here and children were coming and around uh, 45 minutes later something we had 20 30 kids and then we started walk down to the wo where we were going to play and then just like we were the pipers of hamelin children poured out of every alley and street and by the time we arrived at the beach we had two or three times the number of children we started out with we hardly had enough props for all of them no plastic uh, uh, gloves to put on their hats, and the wolf had 12 cubs. He was supposed to have only three, but all the football boys, they really want to be bad wolf cubs. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was a quite a dramatic LARP, and uh, the chickens and sheep, they lived peacefully with the humans in the village, but every day the dreadful wolf came along with his cubs, and they stole a chicken or a sheep. <laughs> this cannot go on. The villagers needed a plan. They decided to try to catch the wolf in a cage, and a chicken was put out as bait. <laughs> the plan went well. The wolf came back, and he was caught. But how to solve the conflict? What shall we do with the wolf? Shall we kill him? The village council had to decide, all the sheep, chickens, and humans together. And ten minutes later, the wolf was convinced to promise to go into the mountains and never come back. <laughs> and uh, the pacifist white man was very happy about this. No more <laughs> war games. <laughs> Everybody were happy. <laughs> <coughs> and the volunteers in particular were very happy. They had successfully made their first children LARP. And we ordered pizza from the king of pizza, the only pizza outlet in the refugee camp. And we had the diplomas for uh, everything. So even if you don't really know how to do it, sometimes you just have to strike when the iron is hot, even if you don't know really what you're doing. And being in a cliche or not, I will never forget at the end of this day when uh, Najat from Al Jalil 
came to me and saying she had realized that uh, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old if we stop playing. 